how we have our technical challenges all sorted out. So first, I'd like to take an opportunity to just introduce myself, and then we're going to talk about the agenda, and I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Hand to continue our presentation for today. Um, I serve as the interim county administrator. Um, I started in this business in grade school, which led me to be able to generate about 35 years in the industry in development, economic development. Um, former city manager uh, in Florida, as well as in Kansas, um, and working uh, to help the unified government solidify their process for a permanent administrator. Um, last year, we had an opportunity to work with staff on an approach that I think will solidify our economic development position. So I wanna go over today's agenda. For the agenda today, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about what we've done um, last year and how we view this year as our year of visioning. Um, we have three sites that we'd like to do a project introduction on and talk about the descriptions. And then we'll explain to you kind of our timeline and the process that we will use for an RFQ that will eventually lead us to an RFP. Um, and at the end, we will have some uh, time that we will allot for questions and answers from uh, those of you who have joined us. So I wanna thank you for taking the time to join us. We are certainly appreciative of your interest in the work that we're doing for the unified government. The mayor, as well as the city commissions, very interested in making sure that we place a priority on economic development and that we look at providing an opportunity for additional revenue for the unified government. So 2023, a year of visioning. For the first time in the history of the unified government, we have an opportunity to take a very broad, comprehensive look at several things. Looking at how we balance land use and transportation as we developed our GoDOT strategic mobility plan, looking at how we focus on housing that will be able to support the economic development strategies, as well as preserving our history and maintaining neighborhoods through our historic preservation plan. We started UG Forward Initiative last year to be able to look at those things that got us through the previous 25 years and those efforts that we need to look at to move us forward to the next 25 years. As part of our community con development consolidated plan and our land bank policy update, we are looking to be able to identify those assets that we have and how we might combine resources for a more intentional, strategic, efficient, and cost-effective way to move forward for the unified government. And finally, looking at our comprehensive housing assessment and our CHIP effort through our health department. So all of these things coming together is no coincidence. It's very good timing. It is not many times that you have an opportunity in an organization to be able to bring so many forces together at the same time and roll them up into your citywide comprehensive plan. So we feel we have a unique opportunity to do some things that are cutting edge and to be able to provide an overall strategy for the unified government for the next 25 years and beyond. And with that, I will turn it over to our director, Mr. Han. Thank you, Ms. Harrison Lee. Again, my name is Gunnar Han. I'm the director of planning and urban design for the unified government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. <clears throat> and I'm gonna quickly run through excuse me, um, the three different sites that we have in this RFQ RFP process before handing it off to development strategies, the consultant we've hired to help us uh, move forward with this RFQ and RFP process. I did wanna just reiterate something that Ms. Harrison Lee said, and we do look forward to taking this opportunity to hear from you all uh, about the type of information and the insights uh, you can share with us so we can make this RFQ RFP process as successful as possible and really redefine community development in Wyandotte County. <clears throat> Now, the first site is our largest site. Um, some of you may have heard of this site in the past. It's located right at the intersection of I-635 and State Avenue. It's the site of the former Indian Springs Mall. And while this site has seen multiple attempts at redevelopment, um, the unified government in the past has tried to stay true to both the vision as defined most recently in the Godot Countywide Mobility Strategy, uh, previously in the State Avenue Corridor Development Plan, <clears throat> um, but also some existing listening sessions we've had for this site specifically 
with our economic development partner, uh, department as soon as, as, as recently, excuse me, as last year, that really hopes to take this opportunity to look at a true transit oriented development mixed use project at this location. I've mentioned that there have been a couple of failed attempts at redevelop the site in the past. The UG well knows that if we wanted to turn this into an industrial warehouse district, we could have done that over a decade ago. And that is not currently our intent um, <clears throat> to do so. Uh, this also provides us an opportunity to rethink transit at the site. You can see kind of from this, uh, from the aerial, the transit center is really inside mid block on North 47. How do we get it to our main um, transit corridor right on State Avenue? A few hundred feet away. The second site is in downtown Kansas City, Kansas. We call this site the Triangle Parcel. Um, it is truly a gateway opportunity into the community as it's right at the end of the Lewis and Clark Viaduct or at the beginning of downtown Kansas City, Kansas. There's access off both Minnesota and State Avenue. Um, it's a bit of a weird shaped parcel. Um, but I think most importantly, um, it is essentially the first developable parcel on Minnesota Ave, which is the, for those who don't know, it's basically Kansas City, Kansas's main street. State Avenue and Minnesota Avenue are the primary transit corridor from downtown KCK all the way out to the western part of our Wyandotte, uh, Wyandotte County in the, at the Legends area. <clears throat> but for this site specifically, and while the downtown area plan is a little dated, admittedly, um, this site is already from an entitlement standpoint for redevelopment. It's, it's land use for high intensity uses. It's zoning for uh, maximum opportunity, whether it be a mixed use office, residential, or some other form. Um, there is no height limit in this CD district. This could be a landmark building as well as a, a, a real generator of activity in our, in our downtown. Now, the third site is admittedly um, probably the most specific in terms of what the UG hopes to produce at the site, but also the most ambiguous in the sense that there's a grouping of properties here. We're looking currently at the 18th and Quindaro intersection, specifically the southeast corner. And if you can see on the left hand underneath the, underneath the description is basically a map of the land bank lots. This project site will require uh, additional land assemblage above and beyond uh, what the UG currently controls in it, and, and in this instance in the, in the land bank. <clears throat> we also believe that this probably will require the most community engagement of all of the sites. Um, one, because it's a named use. Two, because there's land assemblage required. Three, because most of those zoned parcels behind the initial uh, parcels abutting Quindaro Boulevard um, are zoned residential. Uh, depending on, on, on how the site plan works out. But also specifically in the Northeast Area Master Plan, there's a, uh, <clears throat> there's a plan to do a community co-op. Uh, and that co-op is actually in the Northwest quadrant of this exact same intersection. So finding a way to align all these efforts and work, and work towards a redevelopment project at this location, uh, we think is gonna take a little extra effort from a community um, engagement standpoint, but also working with staff and other partners uh, on this potential effort. Um, I did want to, at this time, uh, hand it off to development strategies. Uh, we will see you uh, again, um, or I'll be back again uh, for the Q&A section. Uh, but again, I really want to focus in on the questions that we have to ask all of you. So when we get to that point after development strategies is done with the remainder of the presentation, we look forward to uh, the Q&A. So with that, I'll hand it off to Mr. Andy Fister with Development Strategies. Good morning. Um, I'm Andy Fister with Development Strategies, and we're we're helping UG um, with a few different aspects of this process. Uh, we're going to help draft the RFQ and RFP documents for each site. We're going to help a little bit uh, with with review um, and evaluating the proposals. Uh, we're going to help with the community engagement around the potential with each site. Part of it is you know, helping the UG be transparent about what's going on throughout the process to the development community, but also the neighborhoods. And then um, just a quick couple quick highlights on the schedule for this process. You know, in a month we're going to we're working to release the RFQ and this conversation is intended to help inform what what we're asking for from the development community. Um, we're going to take about a month to review those and then kind of ask a, a select group to respond to the RFP, which will 
come out in June, late June. Our intent is to hopefully select a developer or development team for each site um, at the end of August and then move move forward with what it means to kind of develop those properties. Um, next slide, please. And why are we doing it this way? Um, part of the reason for starting with an RFQ um, is to kind of figure out who's interested in these projects, to figure out how we can um, encourage teaming or, or leadership with minority, local, small developers, um, but to really kind of narrow the field. So we have um, some really great qualified candidates to, to move forward with, but also we aren't asking every developer who's interested to submit a full proposal um, and the resources that um, it takes to get there. So this is an easier initial step to express interest in the projects and kind of move for, toward that formal proposal as we work with the UG to get gather more information throughout the process through the community meetings and uh, potentially some market studies for the sites. Um, next, next slide, please. And then, um, yeah, in June, we'll move to the RFP with some select developers and development teams will be invited to respond to the RFP for each site, RFPs for each site. And um, you, may, you may choose to uh, submit on one site or more than one site, but there's going to be a process for each individual site. Uh, we're really looking for creative and market supported developments that also meet community goals, which are already defined, but we're going to further define through that community engagement in a couple of months. And it's going to be informed also by some, some market analysis. And so uh, we're going to have a 30 day solicit solicitation period for each and really kind of looking again to learn um, in this next phase of this presentation from you all, like what makes you this process attractive for you to uh, respond to and what helps kind of build more um, opportunities for minority local and small developers to to be a part of this next please and so really we have several questions for you um, these are just some questions we thought of and we're Happy to answer um, questions of your own. Um, some of them that are top of mind are what what are the barriers to small minority business participation to be uh, individual applicants for any of the opportunities or joining um, some of the larger development teams? Uh, how can UG work to facilitate some of these um, teaming opportunities? Would market market studies help as you're considering one or more of the sites? to know what, what the parameters of support are, of what's possible for each site that the market will support, uh, what makes it attractive to commit the resources uh, to respond. You know, the RFQ should, RFQ should be a relatively light lift, but, but if you get, get to the RFP process, we know that takes a lot of resources and creativity. Um, what requirements that you've seen in RFPs in the past, what's overly burdensome? Um, there's always a balance between kind of what a UG might require, but but we want to understand like what are barriers to responding. Um, so with that, um, turn it back to Gunner, and and we're happy to to have this discussion. Thank you, Andy. Um, again, so the way we've organized that is if, if anybody has any question or has any answers to some of these questions um, at this point. Um, we'd like you to type them into the chat and we'll sort of share through that way. Um, this is, again, not the moment to um, ask questions of us quite yet. We wanted to make see if we can solicit some feedback from you all. Again, what are the materials that you would expect from the UG in an RFQ and then subsequent RFP process uh, that would encourage you to reply, respond, um, but also just sort of globally, again, what, what are the things you would look for to um, develop in wine.com. I've answered a couple of questions online already and I'm seeing if there's any other. Um, I will say one of the conversations we've been debating internally is how to proceed with a potential market analysis for the RFP process. And while it's not necessarily required or common, 
Um, we wanted to know if, it, if that would assist you all uh, in determining whether you would respond to a future RFP. And I'm starting to see a few comments and questions that are more about the process and stuff. I'm going to hold on those. Um, Does anybody have any other <clears throat> input on things they'd like to see the UG provide in that RFQ? And I know it might take a little bit of time for people to take that in the chat. So let me give that just a, another minute to simmer. And then we can start answering some of these other questions for folks. Gunner, I saw one from Travis Wilson about a clear understanding of the grading criteria during the RFQ period would be helpful. Okay. I think that is a part of our conversation um, to develop said evaluation criteria. I also see a request from Adri from Groundworks Energy about uh, <clears throat> anti-gentrification. For those of you who are unaware, when we completed the Northeast Area Master Plan a few years ago, and then as a follow-up to that, the Northeast Area Heritage Trail Plan just this past year as a part of the GoDOT Countywide Mobility Strategy, excuse me, Strategic Mobility Plan, a, um, an anti-displacement scorecard was developed uh, for the Northeast. And so that's something I think we can um, provide more information to you all as it relates to the 8th and Quadero site specifically. It looks like you guys are having problems seeing everybody else's Q&A, so we'll do our best to just bring up the ones that we see that are germane. We got about 13 that we're running through right now. <clears throat> Further coordination on um, uh, the 18th and Quindaro site. It looks like Groundwork Energy, which is the designated neighborhood business revitalization organization. We call them NBRs in the UG because we love acronyms in uh, local government or any level of government for that matter, um, is also developing its own market study for its Northeast Grocer Co-op that I mentioned that's in the Northwest quadrant of the 18th Quindaro site. <clears throat> Again, I'm seeing a couple of questions specific to the RFQ RFP process. Um, I believe if it's okay with everybody, what I'll say now is um, we'll go ahead and switch to start answering some of your questions specifically about RFQ, the RFQ RFP process itself. Um, I'm gonna leave this slide up for now, just so I can, if anybody comes to mind, any other materials you'd like to see from the UG to respond specifically to the RFQ because it's our first step, but also related to that subsequent RF, those subsequent RFPs as necessary. <clears throat> and if it's okay, I'll just start from the top. Um, first question is who will be vetting the, the UG decision makers? Um, who at the UG will be vetting and reviewing the RFQ RFP submittals? That'll be a collection of UG um, staff um, that will form a selection committee um, it'll probably look like one for either each RFP site or maybe one for all three RFP sites as well as the RFQ. Um, but those are details we haven't worked out quite yet. Um, the next one is how many applicants do we anticipate? We had a pretty good turnout today. I'm showing 80 people in, in participation. Um, I'd say that that's a great response to this kind of pre-RFQ um, uh, 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 meeting, webinar, if you will. Not exactly a pre bid conference yet. Um, we do plan one of those, which we'll talk about in next steps. Um, so we don't know. We hope as many and as diverse as possible. I think it's been really important for uh, uh, for the interim CAO um, and for others who have engaged at staff level on this effort to make uh, to remove as many barriers as entry as possible. 
we're trying to think about how to put this together so local, regional, as well as national developers can participate, as well as other potential uh, teams can form. So we're trying to think about how to break, uh, reduce the barrier to entry for as uh, small local businesses, disadvantaged businesses, and others. Um, that's a good lead into the next question as I read down this list here. They're asking, is there a DBE requirement? Currently, the unified government does not have a DBE requirement. Um, we'd have to run through a whole ordinance process with our board of commissioners to get that done. I believe we're gonna look to potentially have language uh, that describes a preference for teams with disadvantaged businesses, specifically local businesses, but because we don't have an ordinance, we can't tie that to the scoring criteria. Um, it'll just be a preference that we show. Um, in the in the RFP at this time. Um, we are, our procurement department is working on looking into a uh, DB requirement moving forward, but I don't think it's gonna be a part of this RFQ RFP process just because of time. Um, next question, and I'm moving through these as best I can. Next question is, relates to, will the RFQ responses primarily be developer led? I say that's our expectation. Although um, at the RFQ process, I think what we're gonna try to do, and we'd like to hear your input about this as well, um, obviously it's developer focused, but that doesn't mean another, let's just call it team member, uh, couldn't be the convener of another team and move forward. Uh, these RFPs should get relatively specific about the types of things that the UG um, would like to see in those developments, how they'd like to get developed, um, all of our core code of ordinances, design guidelines, and that material will be uh, included as background. So um, again, there's a world where it doesn't necessarily have to be developer driven. And there's a world where the RFQ uh, collects a bunch of different potential um, team members uh, and then uh, how those then qualified firms team themselves or are grouped together in the RFP process is still up for discussion. And I don't know, Mr. Feaster, if you wanted to comment on that one at all or follow up, pile on, if you will. Um, yes, I think you you definitely summarize it well. The RFQ portion of this is to gauge interest. And if you're kind of, you know, for instance, a small local person who really wants to be on a team and would add a lot um, or yeah, add some value, you know, this is the opportunity to submit that. And we would, we would expect to see more defined teams, I think, in the RFP stage. So this allows some time to, to do that as, as Gunnar summarized. Thank you, Andy. Um, and again, I'm doing my best to read through these. I appreciate everybody putting in questions and comments. I just wanted to uh, add on, I'm seeing another comment as it relates to this slide specifically about um, clearly defining how, uh, what our desired outcomes or expectations are for community development, excuse me, for community engagement at each site. Um, in the intro, I did mention that there's been a various levels of engagement at each three sites um, over, quite frankly, the last few years. And so I think it's gonna be different for each site. Um, I think generally we're gonna want to have some, um, some level of community engagement for each, but I think we're really looking to have a community driven focus um, of each of the sites. Um, this is part what the market will bear, I think at each site, um, but also, what the UG's participation and partnership can bring in terms of other community development assets. Um, for instance, we mentioned the transit center at KCATA, we've uh, transit center at the, excuse me, the Indian Springs uh, Mall former site at State Avenue and I-635. Um, there are other community development opportunities there. We've, in the past, the plans have looked at childcare, for instance, as well as a transit center, other potential workforce development. There's a kind of clustering of UG facilities in and around the Indian Springs Mall site as well, where there could be potential for consolidation at the site. Um, so things like that, I think, again, it depends on the context for each. Gunnar, we've gotten quite a few questions regarding expectations for community involvement around each of these sites. Maybe you can speak a little bit to that. 
Um, sure. Uh, I would just reiterate again. I think we expect uh, community engagement scope in each of those um, site locations. I think those will have to be tailored based on the context. Um, I believe that the most engagement is probably going to need to be had at the 18th and Quindaro site because it's not only specific but has the land assemblage issues I mentioned earlier. Um, but I believe that this is an opportunity for us to again redefine what community development looks like, especially since these are Eugene owned, -owned sites. Um, and so it is our expectation for this to be a community driven process. And we're seeing a few recommendations or requests, uh, including uh, clear expectations regarding environmental remediation, uh, what that actually means, as well as uh, questions about making sure we, the RFP is addressing things like stormwater management, soil quality, and urban heat island effect. So uh, those are all question, uh, kind of suggestions that have been put forward in the chat. Another question that's come up for you, Gunnar, and perhaps for Teresa too, is how uh, will this group access the RFQ when it is available? Sure, I'll take a crack at that. And if Ms. Uh, Hoochins, if you could help me answer if I mess, <laughs> mess anything up, that'd be much appreciated. Um, so we're gonna get this with, at next steps, I think, but I'll go ahead and say it now. So the next step after this webinar um, on March 23rd, 2023 time still TBD. Uh, we're going to have a mandatory pre bid conference. That'll be a hybrid event. We'll have in person as well as online uh, for folks to participate in that. It's our expectation that the RFQ will be let that next week, the week of March 27th. <clears throat> um, we have to post it in the mail. There's a couple of requirements that we have to do for state statute and things like that. Um, but it'll most likely, uh, we'll do two things. We'll send it out to everybody who participated in this and or um, the pre bid conference in March. Um, we will also send it through our usual communications for all RFP, RFQ procurements at the UG. We have a large listserv that we send it out to everybody every time something drops. And then it'll be listed on the Unified Government's website accordingly. And Ms. Hoochins, if I miss anything, please let me know. Seeing none. Okay, God, I want to touch on a few questions that we we had uh, come up. Um, first, I want to say I, I really appreciate the interest and the the questions that we're getting uh, surrounding this. Um, I would anticipate that we would also send out the questions with answers to all the participants. But I want to touch on the fact that um, we really would hope that the volume of responses would be such that we have a tough decision. We look forward to a, a healthy competition here. We look forward to the diversity of teams. Um, we will work with our legal department and procurement to um, try to ensure that to the extent we can, that we have some participation from minority developers. Um, we're very sensitive to the issue of gentrification. And we anticipate that the engagement would be with the community such that this vision would be a collaborative effort. And finally, I'm gonna to touch on the question about the drive for the, UD, for the UG desires for each of the sites. As we look at the financial challenges when we develop the budget this year, and we look at some of the gaps that we had financially, um, as well as our citizen survey for a request to improve the quality of life in, in certain neighborhoods, we think that these sites give us an opportunity to improve the quality of life in our neighborhoods, but also to have some economic development opportunities that would address some of the, the financial challenges. So again, with the comprehensive work products that we are engaged in this year, it is an opportunity to have all these things come together. And those are unique opportunities. We don't get an opportunity oftentimes in a jurisdiction to bring all those things together. Um, so this is this is a great opportunity, I think, to create a vision and to chart a course for some strong economic sustainability on a long term basis for the unified government. Uh, 
Governor, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Ms. Harrison Lee. <clears throat> Mr. Feaster, I'm seeing another question um, as it relates to uh, market analyses. Could you maybe elaborate into what our current thinking, or maybe not even our current thinking, but sort of industry best practices? What is what is a market analysis typically look like for this type of development site, as opposed to a market analysis, say, for the entire unified government? Mm -hmm. um, the, the market analysis um, is kind of an optional part of what we're looking at and helping the UG. Um, and what we would do is something for each site specifically, because each is different in character, location, and market potential. We create a market area for each site, kind of based on um, some of the desired uses, but also just under understanding um, that there may be other options. What the market study would help do, um, you know, a lot of times it's not necessarily part of an RFP process because you know, developers will do their own to figure out their own development program. But each of these sites is unique in that there's a, a long history. Um, there's different elements of you know, which communities and, and um, the community desires around each site um, are, are different. And um, the market study would help define those parameters. Since these are UG controlled and there's these community considerations and concerns, you know, it would help define in the RFP, you know, the the US the UG wants mixed use with this kind of target, um, residential, affordable housing, and some of these other uses. And it would show the market support for those uses. That, so it takes an element of uncertainty out of the process for um for the development teams that are interested in submitting. Does that help answer the question? Yes, for me. I think we, we were just asked to elaborate a little bit more on yeah. that specifically. All right, I'm doing my best to answer as many of these questions typed in the chat box. Um, I don't know if you all can see that, but again, I think I, I would also just pause to remind everybody that we are recording this. Um, our expectation is that we will send out slides these slides, as well as the recording to everybody who registered, we will also be posting both of those things uh, on a website, on our website, um, uh, technically the economic development web page within the unified government website. All right, I would just look to anybody else on the UG team of panelists who either have questions for the group of attendees or any other clarifications they'd like to pile in on as I continue to read more questions. There are a couple questions about qualifications or selection criteria um, that I would like to address. Um, we are working on defining those specifically for the RFQ over the next few weeks, and they will be clearly defined um, when we have the pre-bid conference and in the RFQ document. Um, generally speaking, we'd like to see, you know, the team make up um, kind of experience or ideas for the specific project, um, you know, relevant projects, et cetera. What we're trying to balance in terms of with the goal of having um, better minority and small business um, participation is like, you know, how much do we score years of experience? Traditionally, that's a normal metric for one of these things. So those are some of the things we're 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 working on this working on. We're we're definitely open to your input and recommendations in that regard. But those will be clearly defined um, here in the next month. And then again, for the RFP, there'll be a bit more specific um, for that, for that, for those who move forward to the RFP for each site. And Mr. Feaster, as a follow-up to that, I'm looking at another question that's uh, germane to what you just said. I'm, uh, do you think that there are certain um, certifications or other qualifications, well, 
specifically certifications that would qualify a team to submit for the RFQ or is it relatively open-ended in our thinking? I would say the RFQ is more open-ended. Um, there are certain, you know, like as part of a development team, we'd want a licensed contractor and an architect, but that is in the RFQ stage. Um, there could certainly be non-licensed professionals and builders and so forth that can be part of a bigger team. Um, and that's what the RFQ process would help us kind of identify and vet. I also just wanted to read a comment for, for the sake of the, the group on the call here. Um, it's from Mr. Steve Allison, um, specifically as it relates to if there are market analyses, tying those descriptions for those market analyses at each site to a list of potential um, UG provided incentives. So I think generally speaking, like every site in the unified government, um, these three sites are potentially open for development agreements um, using, using the old uh, former, excuse me, Indian Springs Mall site that's gone through multiple different iterations of development agreements as an example. Um, that's a different parallel track as we get closer to um, past the RFP process, I would say. Um, but it's a good point. Uh, piggybacking on another question and comment related to this as well, I think the UG will do some additional research and look at, look at two things. One, the grants um, from the infrastructure bill or other um, uh, capital maintenance improvement projects that the UG has that would align or are in proximate location to each of those sites, just so people have a better understanding of the, the planned investments in and around each location um, and or the planned um, federal dollars the UG plans to uh, looks to pursue in the next probably year, maybe, maybe longer. Um, and I think we can provide that information as well. Um, there is a question here, actually, Teresa, this one I think is directly to you and I don't know the answer to it. Um, it is, are the responses to the RFQs public information? After it's been completed. It's not like a bid where we post the amounts as they come in. Um, that, that could be provided at a later time, but not while the RFP process is going on. Okay. So yes, but not until we make a decision. Understood. Um, okay, I'm seeing a slowdown on questions. With that, I'm gonna, is there anybody else on the UG team that has any other follow-up questions or answers as it relates to what has been discussed or anything else as it relates to what we might look to the development community in terms of what we need to develop the RFQ? Thank you very much for your attendance today. Um, we're looking to publicly put out notices about the RFP, and we would hope that you would spread the word as well so that we are able to get um, some very good opportunities for development in the unified government. And thank you to staff for the presentation and to our consultant partners. All right, well, with that, um, again, just a quick follow up for next steps. Again, we're looking to have a mandatory pre bid conference on March 23rd, dates to come out shortly. We plan the release of the RFQ shortly thereafter, the week of March 27th. Again, details to be uh, 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 developed and sent out shortly. <clears throat> One more time, we'll send these slides and a recording of the uh, presentation that we just had in the QA session either later today or first thing tomorrow. Um, we'll also be posting all this information on our website. We'll make sure everybody has the webpage to look to. Um, when the RFQ is released, we'll have another round of outreach on top of this, um, but you can always find those RFQs and any RFP, RFQ from the unified government on our website through the, through the procurement department. You can just basically Google unified government RFPs and we'll take the strings in sight um, if you need to. So again, from, from all of us at the Unified Government, and, and as Ms. Harrison Lee uh, said, thank you very much for your time and, and interest.
in these three sites. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me um, at the email and the phone number on this last slide. Um, with that, have a great day, everybody, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Signing off. <laughs>